Egypt is known as the haven for many historical figures and artifacts and is one of the most historically significant places in the world. Archaeologists have numerous discoveries in Egypt, some of which have rewritten history from how it was originally told. It is fair to say that this is yet another one of said discoveries. Today on Crunch, we'll be looking into the infamous invasion of the Hyksos dynasty in Egypt and how recent discovery is changing how the story that we have been told all this time. The Hyksos Invasion of Egypt Not much is known of the Hyksos period. In fact, the only ancient account of this period written by the Greco-Egyptian priest and historian Menetho wasn't written until the 3rd century BC, almost 2,000 years after the Hyksos period ended. In Menetho's account, the Hyksos were described as a society of nasty savages who raided southern Egypt and enforced their culture and religion on local Egyptians, disposing of their men who dared to challenge their superior power, and capturing their wives and children, forcing them into slavery. As the years went by, Manitho's work was lost but was extensively quoted by later writers, especially Flavius Josephus in the first century AD. Shadowing Manitho's work, Josephus described the beginning of the Hyksos invasion in this manner. A people of ignoble origin from the east, whose coming was unforeseen, had the audacity to invade the country, which they mastered by main force without difficulty or even battle. Having overpowered the chiefs, they then savagely burnt the cities, raised the temples of the gods to the ground, and treated the whole native population with the utmost inhumanity, disposing some and carrying off the wives and family of others into slavery. Nowadays, modern Egyptologists and historians have rejected Manetho's narrative of the Hyksos period as the truth. They believe that his narrative was influenced by more recent foreign invasions of Egypt. According to them, the Hyksos entrance into Egypt was peaceful and brought about advancement in Egyptian civilization. Recent research which involved chemical analysis of the skeletons found in the city of Avaris, the capital of the Hyksos dynasty shows that the Hyksos were immigrants rather than hostile invaders. This analysis was centered on comparing the levels of strontium isotopes in each skeleton's enamel of the teeth. Strontium is a trace element that is utilized by the bones and teeth and is obtained mainly from food and water. Some of the skeletons analyzed dated back about 350 years before the Hyksos presence in Egypt, and others dated back to the reign of the Hyksos dynasty and the result of the analysis was shocking. Most of the skeletons belonged to local Egyptians, while just a small percentage were foreign-born, but that wasn't all. There was a huge sex bias in the results. The study showed that about 77% of the foreigners were women. This wouldn't have been the case if the Hyksos were a band of savages. If they were, they would have greatly outnumbered the natives of Avaris, and their population would have consisted mainly of men. So, if they weren't violent people, who were the Hyksos? Where did they come from? And what was their business in Egypt? The Great War of Thebes and Avaris From the 15th to 17th dynasty, the leaders of Egypt coexisted with the prosperity of the Hyksos in Lower Egypt, and for many years, there was a good trade relationship between Thebes and Avaris. Unfortunately, this relationship went south and a military campaign was started against the Hyksos, but how did they get there? According to Manetho, Josephus, and other known historical accounts of the war, which are pro-Theban, the war against the Hyksos was portrayed as a noble act of national liberation. However, modern Egyptologists no longer think this perspective is accurate. The conflict between the Theban government and Hyksos began during the reign of the Theban king, Sekenre Ta. Historians are not sure what transpired between the kings of both kingdoms, but the mummy of Sekenre shows he died from several axe blows to the head, apparently in a battle between Thebes and Avaris. According to a satire based on Egyptian history, the Hyksos ruler Apophis triggered the war when he sent a message to Sekenenra demanding he remove a pool of hippopotamus. It read, Do away with the hippopotamus pool which is on the east of the city, for they prevent me sleeping day and night. Some accounts believe the message was centered on a religious basis. 
The Thebans frequently practiced hippopotamus hunting, which the Hyksos thought was offensive, because the animal symbolized their worship of Baal or Set. However, Sakhanenra saw Apophis's message as a challenge to his authority, which fueled the existing conflict between both kingdoms. The Theban king fell in battle during the first encounter between Sakhanenra and Apophis, so the throne was passed on to his successor, Kamose. Kamose had reservations about the Hyksos, but he was also not fond of the division of Egypt. In the first three years of his reign, the new Theban king launched a military campaign against Hyksos and other non-Egyptian kingdoms within Egypt. One of the three monumental obelisks at Karnak in Thebes is inscribed with Kamose's complaint about the state of Egypt. It reads, To what effect do I perceive it, my might, while a ruler is in Avaris and another in Kush? I sit joined with an Asiatic and a Nubian, each man having his own portion of Egypt. I shall engage in battle with him, for my intention is to save Egypt, striking the Asiatics. Kamose recorded success in his campaign against the Asiatics, but soon after his campaign was launched, he died. His legacy was carried on by his successor, Pharaoh Amose I. The successes of Amose's campaign against the Hyksos were recorded in the tomb of one of his soldiers, Amose, son of Ibana. Amose also called the beloved of Montu the Egyptian war god had some artifacts in his burial chamber which bore inscriptions showing him ending some Hyksos. Who were the Hyksos? In the 12th dynasty under the reign of Amenhemat I, about a hundred years before the Hyksos arrived in Egypt, Lower and Upper Egypt were unified and the country basked in the strength of this unity. One of the factors that fostered this oneness was when Amenhemat changed the capital city from Thebes in Upper Egypt to a city called Ititawi which he founded in the middle of both parts of Egypt. In contrast, the 13th dynasty was highlighted by instability. Egypt was divided into various kingdoms and the capital city was moved back to Thebes in Upper Egypt. Averis, a port town in Lower Egypt, was mainly populated with Semites, which the ancient Egyptians referred to as Amu. Towards the end of the 13th dynasty, a fast-growing group of immigrants began to take control of Averis. The 14th dynasty was founded by some of these immigrants who seceded from Egypt. The Hyksos' presence in Egypt marked an era in Egyptian history known as the Second Intermediate Period, which spanned 1782 to 1570 BC. When they arrived in Egypt in 1782 BC, they gained a foothold in the city of Avaris near the Nile Delta. Some say they originated from Canaan, others say Palestine. However, what is certain is they were Middle Easterners who likely migrated to Egypt for commercial purposes. And as they grew in numbers, they amassed military and political power, which enabled them to take control of most of Lower Egypt and the Nile Valley as far as Qusay. Hyksos is the Greek translation of the ancient Egyptian phrase Hekau Kashut, which literally translates to rulers of foreign land. This led some scholars to believe that the Hyksos were royals and noblemen who were driven from their homes and sought refuge in Avaris. Very quickly after their arrival, the foreign rulers gained control of the Avaris commercially, making treaties and contracts with governors of other regions in Lower Egypt, until they controlled a considerable amount of the land and were able to exert political power. The Second Intermediate Period spanned three dynasties, and the Hyksos were in control of Lower Egypt the entire time. According to archaeological finds, the Hyksos were culturally rich people who brought their customs and traditions to Egypt. From hieroglyphics dating back to about 2000 BC, the Hyksos were depicted to have different attires that stood out from local Egyptians. They were dressed in colorful robes, which were distinct from the white clothes worn by local Egyptians. Their burial traditions were also different from Egyptians. They buried their dead within settlements, unlike the locals who carried out internments on the city's outskirts. Their males were buried with bronze weaponry and without protective amulets. The most elite had horses or other equids buried outside the tombs. Although they stood out, the Hyksos tried to imbibe Egyptian culture. They placed Egyptians in significant positions and adopted some Egyptian customs, fashion, and even religion. According to Egyptian religion, the Hyksos worshipped Set, 
which was a different representation of their chief god, Baal. Their time in Avaris was highlighted by peace and advancement in civilization. When the Hyksos were driven out of Egypt in the 17th dynasty, it wasn't due to heroic efforts. The Egyptian government just felt threatened by the progress of foreigners in Egypt. The Legacy of the Hyksos It is known that the Hyksos ruled in Egypt for over a hundred years. However, their system of governments, the length of tenure, and the total number of their rulers are unknown. In ancient Egyptian history, the Hyksos rulers were not included in the list of kings because they were not considered legitimate rulers of Egypt. According to Manetho's history account and the fragments of the Turin king list, about six Hyksos kings were identified. However, the two most recognized kings are Kion and Apophis. It was also confirmed that the Hyksos dynasty ended under the leadership of Kamudi. Each ruler has a scarab on which their names and titles were inscribed. A large palace was discovered in Averis which is thought to have been built for King Kion. The Hyksos were not known to construct any court art or monuments, however, they inscribed their names on existing monuments. For example, King Kion's name was inscribed on monuments from an earlier Egyptian dynasty. Subsequent Hyksos kings seized several sphinxes depicting Amenhemut III and transported them to Avaris, where they inscribed their own names on them. This made earlier Egyptologists refer to them as the Hyksos sphinxes. Though the Hyksos tried to absorb as much Egyptian culture as possible, they gave back to Egypt. They brought new technologies with them, including horses and chariots, the compound bow and metal weapons. They taught local Egyptians how to make bronze daggers, introducing them to bronze metalwork. They didn't share only military advancements with local Egyptians. They also brought about crafts and agricultural revolution. The Hyksos dynasty was sorely defeated in this campaign and Manetho's accounts of the aftermath of the war read that the Middle Easterners were forced to flee through the desert back to the east. Manetho claimed no fewer than 240,000 entire households with their possessions left Egypt and traversed the desert to Syria. Once again, there is no archaeological evidence that supports Manetho's claims. However, archaeologist Manfred Biotech says that based on archaeological finds, the Hyksos were stripped of their commercial and political power, forced to stay back in Egypt, and took on other trades under Egyptians as artisans and craftsmen. So, what do you think is the true history of the Hyksos dynasty? Let us know in the comments below. Thanks for watching Crunch History, and as always, don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe.